Welcome to this summit session on one of the most remarkable topics of study in science, the so-called biofield sciences. I consider the biofield one of the last great frontiers of science and certainly of medicine because when we fully understand the nature of the biofield, it will help us more readily maintain our own health and our well-being. Beyond that, though, I think more importantly, when we understand the biofield more fully, it will help deepen our understanding of our own very nature as human beings. We're fortunate to have four panel members with deep expertise in the biofield, expertise ranging from the research side all the way through the clinical side and clinical applications of the biofield. With that, uh, thank you very much, uh, each panel member. It's great to have you here as part of the summit. Uh, to get going, I want to uh, have each of you uh, provide a brief introduction of yourself. I think this will help our viewers right out of the gate have a sense of who you are and the type of work you've been doing. And then after your brief introduction, we'll launch into our discussion. Of course, during the discussion, you'll have much more time to share with us your work. So I'd like to begin in this order, uh, Dr. Bengston, and then Dr. Dunseeth, then Reverend Barstody, and then Dr. Jan. So we'll begin with you, Bill, and then when you're done, we'll move on to you, Ross, and then Tiffany and Shamani. So let's begin the introductions. Thanks, and hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. This hopefully will be extremely interesting. Um, my background is in healing research. Uh, I've been doing that for, I think, 105 years. Um, I'm going to do it maybe another 30 or 40. Uh, uh, most of the research I do is laboratory-based. Uh, I just actually now, I've finished my 19th and 20th mouse experiment. Uh, I primarily have done experiments on cancer. Uh, I get some reasonably interesting results. Um, and I'm looking at this point, my, my particular focus is, can we make healing conventional and practical and take it out of the crazy side? And I don't mean that by the people, but people considering it crazy, make it mainstream. Uh, my background is in statistics. I do numbers. Um, I'm also the president of the Society for Scientific Exploration. Uh, this is a group of people, researchers, scientists from 27 countries who are interested in anomalies uh, and do rigorous types of applications in, in anomalies. So thanks, and I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Ross. Thanks, Paul. I'm Ross Dunseeth. I'm an electrical engineer by background. First got introduced into the world of anomalies at, uh, as an undergrad student at Duke University back in the day and uh, did some parapsychological biofeedback type research and, of all places, the electrical engineering department. Uh, there I got introduced to the wild and wonderful world of EEG, neuroimaging, and went on to get involved in designing and building EEG systems for several years. But I went back to the psychic research world around the year 2000, uh, joining the group at UVA Division of Perceptual Studies, where I'm now the co-director of the Westfall Neuroimaging Lab, where we do studies there uh, involving uh, primarily looking at the idea that mind can exist independent of the brain. And so DOPS has got in reincarnation research going on, and uh, we do studies with mediums. Uh, I've been involved in psychokinesis-type studies, where we're trying to do uh, uh, combined neuroimaging with uh, EEG and uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, have found some interesting things so far with that, but I've also joined up with uh, the Monroe Institute, which is uh, just south of uh, Charlottesville. Um, Monroe Institute's been around for about 50 years. Uh, was started by Robert Monroe, who was having profound out-of-body experiences, and went on to, to start an institute that was researching and running educational programs for people having all kinds of experiences, including healing. Um, in the process of doing that, I have... Uh, now started some biofield measurements, and uh, that's one thing I can talk about today. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so that's in it in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a lot of fascinating material. I'm very much hoping you can get to that. We will get to much of it. 
Tiffany, tell us about yourself and your work and interest in the biofield. Thank you. This is so much fun. I, I love hearing. I, I know Bill and Ross, you're new to me, and yet what you do is not new. And so it's fascinating. And thank you. Um, I, I was actually one of those kids that uh, could move objects, but I could only do it when I was mad. <laughs> I mean, it took anger in order to make things actually happen for me. Anyway, I was, um, I'm Tiffany Barsotti, and I'm really been mostly a healer. I went to graduate seminary school and studied with Carolyn Mason, Norm Sheely for many years. And there was a lot of EEG and a lot of different gear that we were using. So I have really been looking at in the last few years, how do we use subtle energy devices in our clinical practices in order to be able to visualize the invisible? Because what I find is that it's very empowering for another person to be able to see that there really is something to the field. And the way it presented itself to me as a child is a lot of information. And I would see it in almost like cloud formations of information and then be able to speak about what it is that I was seeing to, to much annoyance of people that weren't asking the question, of course. And it, so it was very present to me. And then I, I willed it away for many other unknown, I mean, many other reasons that we won't get into today. But the, the focus of really finding a way to be able to tell this story, this energetic story, because it's very real. Mm -hmm. yeah. Real indeed. Thank you, Tiff. Uh, Shamani, of course, all the viewers of the summit are familiar with you already, but please give us a uh, background on your interest in the biofield. Thank you, Paul. Well, my background is in psychoneuroimmunology. I did my doctoral work at UC San Diego with an incredible mentor. You may have heard of him. His name is Paul Mills. <laughs> So Paul was my graduate mentor, um, really can't say enough amazing things about that experience of working with him. And I conducted, went on as a clinical psychologist, my interest has always been, how can these therapies help patients? How can they help mitigate suffering in patients where other current solutions really aren't working well? And unfortunately, we know that's a lot. It's chronic disease, it's mental health. There are a lot of approaches um, that are being used, but sometimes not as successfully as we would like. So in my journey of conducting randomized controlled clinical trials on things like cancer-related fatigue with these biofield healing approaches, looking at it for PTSD, and most recently we looked at uh, the effects of distant sound healing um, for anxiety during the pandemic, throughout that journey I became acquainted with more and more researchers that were studying this who needed support because, as Bill and others have mentioned, this is still considered not very mainstream even though the data is very real. So we formed the nonprofit collaborative, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, to help support these scientists in community, ideally also in fundraising to help support research. And I've just been really pleased at how, um, how amazing the community continues to be, both the scientists and healers that are working together to advance this field. So that's a little bit of my background. Wonderful. Thank you. So Tiffany mentioned uh, the word subtle energy. It reminds me of some of your work, Ross. And the question is, does biofield healing, as we know it, involve something called subtle energy, or is it something else? Right. The big question. Um, so there's a bit of a debate going on about this, I know, out there. And uh, I, I would have to say in my experiences, which I can talk a little bit about, it looks to me like there is actually a subtle energy. But now... There can be other interpretations of it. I know one interpretation is, that, oh, this is just basically mind affecting matter. Um, there is no, there is no uh, carrier, so to speak, like a subtle energy. But it's energetic. The response, the effect is energetic. And I have witnessed firsthand physical healing. Uh, you know, if, if that's not an energetic effect, um, I don't know what is. So I, I, I got interested in this also partly because in our PK studies, I noticed that some people seem to be generating large voltages or electric fields near their bodies. And uh, I was going to the MC Square program at Monroe with my box of sensors, um, and saw this effect. I mentioned it to Joe Gallenberger, who is the facil facilitator of that program, and he showed me a very interesting 
little, uh, it's almost like a parlor trick, I guess, in a way. We went down in the basement where it was damp, a tile floor. There's no possibility of static electricity affecting this. He got himself into the right mode and was able to light a fluorescent light, holding his hand next to it, flicking. I had a little static meter that I held near him, and it was registering a few hundred volts static electricity on him. Uh, that got my interest, and then I saw it again. There's a guy named Ed Edwards, who uh, some people may have heard of. He's um, He calls himself an energy therapist. Um, he's got a lot of electrical stuff going on. Uh, we, he, we had him at the DOPS lab. We'd sit him in a chair with that static meter, and clearly he's building a charge on his body. I mean, the, the voltage level is going up and up and up. And then we would put other staff members in the exact same position, ask them to do that, and nobody could. So clearly, you know, Ed Edwards is doing some strange electrical thing. I could say more about what he's doing because we often have equipment failures when he's in the lab. I've heard of that kind of phenomenon. In fact, I've witnessed it quite a bit where certain people have endless problems with their computers and their phones and so forth. Bill, you wanted to chime in. Yeah, I'm going to take a skeptical point of view. Um, I, I, I come from a skeptical background, which doesn't mean I don't think the phenomena are real. I just uh, I have to question and, and, and try to refute everything I say out loud, too. Uh, so I have this little bird on my shoulder that's always yelling at me going, no, that's not right, you know, and, and it, it gets exhausting. Um, I have no, first of all, in terms of, uh, Paul, your question of subtle energy, uh, I've seen responses uh, very, very often in the lab which aren't subtle. <laughs> you know, these are, you know, subtle energy conveys the idea that, well, it's a little thingy here, there. And I, I, I got stuff that will knock your socks off, you know, and, and so it's, it's not very subtle. Um, but my, my, my questioning is the idea of energy. Um, I don't in any way dispute what, what Ross is describing as having a change in voltage and all those kinds of things. And, and I suspect that that is a reasonably widespread kind of human phenomenon that we have these kind of changes in the physical space and on the body, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know how much of that is actually having to do with healing. And so I would make a distinction between a psychokinetic effect and a healing effect. And healing, if you just look in gross terms, I mean, I, I, I can't make sense out of it, even though I have a, a boatload of experiments in it. Uh, one of the things that doesn't seem to matter in healing is distance. So if I do an experiment with a cage of mice and I'm holding the actual cage, uh, I get X effect. If I do it cross-country and I don't have the cage, I get the same X effect. Um, how does an energy do that without diminishing in strength? You know, and I, I, I start flopping on the floor wondering about that. And I don't have the answer, uh, but it, it doesn't correspond to the conventional idea of what energy um, might be. Um, and, and so how does it also target? Uh, so I can have cage X and cage Y, and it's across the country, and cage X will be affected and cage Y won't. Uh, that's crazy talk to me. You know, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Uh, I produce it in the laboratory. I produce reliable effects in the laboratory. But I can't reconcile that with the notion of energy, at least insofar as an energy that I understand, subtle or not. And I'll, I'll zip it. Thanks. That's fascinating. I hadn't considered this idea of differentiating the healing aspects of certain energies on our body versus the psychokinetic and, and so forth. But Chamini, you wanted to jump in. You know, this is such an important point, and Bill, I know you and I have had some discussions on this, especially when we explore energy healing at a distance. So what do we actually know from the data? We know that energy healing works for patients. We know that it works beyond a placebo, looking at placebo, very well-controlled placebo trials. We also know that because it works on cells right? It works in animal models. And as Bill said, it works at a distance. And I'm just reminded by the definition of a biofield that was put forth at NIH in the 90s, of course, spearheaded by a great pioneer in biofield research, Dr. Beverly Rubick, who I know all of you are familiar with here on this panel. And they described the biofield as a massless field, not necessarily electromagnetic, a field of energy and information. 
And Bill, you're absolutely right. What's what's fascinating is that this so-called energy seems to have an intelligence, and we've seen this in your lab and others' labs, including Gloria Gronowick's lab, um, recent research that is now coming out of Dr. Himal Patel's lab at UCSD, um, Lorenzo Cohen's lab at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and more, where, for example, they're looking at healing and healers that are working with cells that are healthy, and the cells tend to grow. That is, they proliferate, right? And then they look at the same healer doing the same type of healing on cells that have cancer and the cells diminish. That is, they don't proliferate. They go in the opposite direction. So what I'm curious about is why as scientists, and I think as people, we often are always focused on it's one versus the other, <laughs> you know, instead of saying perhaps there's a both and, maybe there's a local effect and a non-local effect. Maybe it's energetic as we describe energy as something that moves and you know does work and drops off at a distance maybe there is some sort of energetic effect but also an informational effect which may not have to do with the way we describe energy so my question really to the panel is could it be both and you know tiffany I, i'd love to hear what your perspective is on this indeed tiff thank you and i i agree with bill saying it, it's anything but subtle this energy is not subtle and and it's ubiquitous. We just don't necessarily have a way to quantify it in the in the visible range in the way that science really says if seeing is believing, then it is not seeing, not believing. And I, I think these kind of go together. But to pick up on what you guys were speaking on on these um, the intelligence and information is uh, this is a question for all of us to think about, and I'd love to hear each of your answers. Is intention information in itself that also gives the it, the direction for where it was going to, you know, maybe tease out? And I also think that resonance plays a role. But when you're talking about mice in one cage and mice in another cage, they're not thinking, "Oh, I'm going to receive this healing right now." They're they're not thinking that way. Whereas people that I've had on my table. I make sure that there, or as much as I can, have an influence that there is a receptivity to that intention and that resonance for what is being offered. Please, Shamini and Bill. <laughs> when you were saying that, Tiff, it reminded me of uh, an anecdote, if you will, that Lorenzo Cohen shared with the work that he's been doing with uh, these mice with cancer and looking at the effects of healing and what he noticed. This was work he did with Sean Harabans, who many of you may know, Ross, maybe you looked at him in other contexts in parapsychology. Whenever Sean would go near the cage where the mice were, the mice would crowd around. It was the darndest thing. And, and, and Lorenzo actually took video of it. And of course, being a scientist, Lorenzo said, well, let's figure this out. Is it any man that kind of looks like Sean? I mean, so he would put other men that were sort of same height, same build, you know, same weight in front of the cage and the mice wouldn't crowd around. But when Sean Harabance would come in after they had received healing from us, the, mi the mice would run to him right away. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill, let's go to you. And then I have a question for Ross. I, I think there's a lot of power in the idea of thinking of healing as information. Uh, and I don't know how fungible information and energy might be, uh, but I think they all have to be worked in there. I don't, I don't mean throwing out energy with, you know, the baby with the bath, uh, but I don't think we can say, oh, it's energy and, you know, we're, then we're all happy. Uh, I've done the same uh, stuff with mice. Uh, when it, if I've got mice in a cage um, and they need help, they're going to go to my left hand. Uh, we, we do this in a variety of labs. It drives the people crazy. We spin the cage. That doesn't make mice happy. Uh, but we spin the cage and we stop and we put our hands down and they always move to the left hand. Now, here's the interesting part. They only move to the left hand while they have a need. And once the need is over, it doesn't happen anymore. And I suspect this is an underlying theme that I can get, take you on a journey if you want to, not only with mice, but also cell cultures and also with placebos and a variety of other things, that healing might be driven not by the healer, but by the healee. And that if there is a need, something happens. Now that doesn't deny that there are people like Sean who can psychokinetically do this or that or, you know, and all that. I don't minimize that at all. But I think a good chunk of healing, and I don't know the proportion of the chunk, but a good chunk of healing is really driven by the healy. And so we have mice 
if the mice are healthy and you put your hands around the cage, they look at you like, why are you doing this? If they have cancer, they go, they go looking for the left hand and they move to the left hand. Once they're cured, they don't go to the left hand anymore. Now, I got cell culture growth and, and such using the same idea. Uh, we have bacteria and we treat bacteria that have no need. Nothing really happens. You know, we don't get the psychokinetic effect of large growth curves and all those kind of things. It's just the, the, the bacteria look at me like the mice do, like, what do you want? But if you harm a cell and we put them through scratch tests, the cells will they'll genomically change. I'm going to leave out the details. They'll genomically change only after they've been hurt. The cells themselves, you put your hands around nothing, but if you, in effect, make the cells sick or have the cells with a need, the cells are the drivers of the healing. The mice are the drivers of the healing. And you guys have more clinical experience than I do, so maybe it's you know similar in people. I'm scared of people, so I'll shut up. <laughs> but but I like a follow-up question on that, please, Bill, because what is it about the mice who are in some kind of healing need that are attracted to the left hand? What are they seeing? What are they what what are they assuming will come from that hand versus a right hand of a person? I don't know. Uh, and I've drawn a bunch of EEGs and functional MRIs and do that trying to figure out what is it, uh, are we left side dominant? Are we right side dominant? Where in the brain, you know, does this or that? And the answer is, I don't know, uh, but they'll go to this spot on the hand. Um, and if you have a bunch of mice in the cage, and I did a, mo a movie, it's, it's reasonably interesting, they'll actually take turns. Uh, so they'll go into a circle. It's like the little circle dance, and they'll put their tumor as close as possible to this spot on the hand. And then if one mouse sits there and gets really selfish, the others will go like, hey, come on, buddy, move, you know, move on, move on. It's my turn. And they just rotate as long as they're, as long as they have a need. Fascinating. Tiffany, you, you're enthusiastically shaking your head. Do you have an answer to this phenomenon? Well, I have a proposal and I, I know you want to get to Ross, but while we're on this topic, I think it's relevant. So I, I'm trained as also a chronic healer amongst many other modalities and also in, in Rudolf Steiner's model, the, speaks to the left hand. And I also did years of thermography measuring hand chakras. And the hand chakras of where the thermal imaging is coming out, because they are very exactly where you just pointed, Bill, these are notable in people who are doing active healing. So they're, they pop right out. Now, in pranic healing, our left hand becomes the receiver hand. The right hand becomes the working hand with which we are taking out information. And I, I totally agree with you that all healing is self-healing. Out information or adding to. But that's just to give the right hand something to do because the direction is actually coming through into the left hand. So really, we only need to do that. But you know, this is why they call it hand waving, right? Because we end up doing a lot of hand waving. So there, that's at least in the esoteric understanding. I can't give you the mechanism, but Rudolf Steiner spoke about the receptivity and how it is that you make these linkages in of the uh, as above, so below, as below, as so above. And the hermeticists also spoke about this activity happening in, in being able to direct mental energy through the palm chakra of the left hand. That's all I'll say. That, that's, that's great information. We've been speaking a bit uh, about the healies and the healers. Uh, Ross, I know you've done work on healers and you've identified some unique aspects of their physiology. Is that all the time or is that when they're in the midst of doing healing or both? Um, well, yeah, that's actually sort of the question I'm trying to get at. Uh, first of all, I, I have to agree with Bill you know, there is this distance issue and the information issues. Uh, so clearly this is more complicated than just an electric field that's appearing on somebody. However, these electric fields are, are unusual and they may be correlates to some sort of effect. I don't know. Um, what I can say about healers is over the years in running PK studies, we often get healers who are also adept at psychokinetically influencing electronic sensors. You know, so, so clearly they've got something going on there with that. And then, uh, 
you know, that's sort of where it stands right now. We've got all this sort of smoke going on. We ran a kind of a pilot study at Monroe with just taking Monroe uh, participants. And, and by and large, they are a self-selected population of people who are having experiences and want to learn more about them. Uh, we just simply asked them to uh, stand in our measuring environment, which I should quickly say was a replication of Elmer Green's work that was done in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, it was called the Copper Wall Room Series. What they did was they set up a uh, experimental chamber that had an insulated floor and they had some copper walls on the, the walls. Um, basically, the idea here was they're insulating a person from the environment. So if there's some sort of subtle charge movement in the body or charge accumulation from the environment, it would tend not to bleed off and, and you can measure it with some uh, accuracy. So we were running that study and I, it's a very delicate measurement. It, you have to really watch out for artifact, static electricity in the environment, all that stuff. But in, with our best effort, we found that a lot of people if they simply are just standing there for 15 or 20 minutes and visualizing energy flowing through their body, you will see this potential rise. And it's anomalous. I mean, there's no known physiological explanation for somebody that's got 5, 10, 15, 70 volts of potential appearing on their body, which is what Ed Edwards did. And his healing partner got 50, and then we had a medium from DOPS who came down and on demand could get 15 volts and said it was from his heart chakra. So, you know, I consider it a correlate. Um, is it a necessary condition for healing? I bet you probably not, but uh, is it sufficient? I don't know. When some of these people are getting high voltages, we also see a random number generator go off randomness, which tends to say, oh, there's some sort of an informational aspect to this as well, and they're setting up some kind of field around themselves. And I've had some personal experiences with that as well as with that as well. So correlates, maybe. Correlates. Yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating. I hadn't heard about that aspect because I wondered where is that energy coming from, at least for the one person, the medium said the heart chakra. Shamani, you you're a scientist, but you've also trained in the healing arts, uh, how to work with the chakras and so forth. What is subtle energy to you and how does that fit into what we're describing so far? Well, you know, this has been around for millennia, right? The subtle energy aspect of what we call the biofield now in Western science has been known and has been used in self-healing approaches and self-other healing approaches for so long in pretty much every culture around the world. So for me, as both a practitioner and a scientist, I look to those traditions and the knowledge base behind those traditions to understand, learn more, and make connections and, you know, to me, I'll share, I'm doing more teaching now, teaching the healing keys out of my new book that was recently released by Sounds True. The third part of that book is all practical. And um, I'll tell you, you know, we just finished a, a workshop the other day. I was teaching at Sivananda Ashram, Shivananda Ashram in the Bahamas. Beautiful place and healing in and of itself, right? Interestingly, as we did these practices, we had several people say, I have no pain. I've been suffering from chronic fatigue for over seven years, and today's the first day I've been without pain. And as a psychologist, I sort of put that layer on top of it, and I remind people that your energy has always been here. What we call your subtle energy, whether we define it as chi, prana, ki, whatever we describe, it's your field. It's your biofield. Some of it we can measure, some of it we can't. There is a very strong connection between the emotions and the vital force, as you know, has been described in Vedic and other traditions. So what I'm really excited about as a clinician and a teacher is just for people where this is really new and they think, oh, well, energy healing is that thing that like I have to go to a Reiki practitioner or whatever is helping them understand how they can connect with their own field in a moment-to-moment -moment basis, whether that's meditation, Tai Chi, Qigong, so many practices, and how they can tune into the energy of their emotions even, notice if anything has been stuck literally in the field of the body and allow it to move. And we see these really wonderful healing effects that occur, and it's not magic. It's not something someone even has to do to you. It's just something that you have to learn learn about to be aware of. So. That's where I get really excited about the so-called subtle aspects is it's something that's available to everyone. You don't have to be an adept practitioner for years and years to be able to access the flow of energy in your body. 
That is, for me, a, a beautiful take-home point uh, for what, what will be this entire panel, that people can do their own healing on themselves, don't have to have extensive, endless years of training. Tiffany, a question. Your perspective on what subtle energy is. I know you have uh, deep experience in these areas. And how does that relate to the healing going on? I'm agreeing with, with everyone here. And the subtle energy like I said, I, I don't feel it is so subtle. Be, and it, it's, you know, we have evidence of it when we get into a field relationship with someone else and it's like, oh, I don't like that or I do like that. We can make an instant sort of felt sense about the energy that's around us. And yes, there are tools that are now starting to emerge in the field with, you know, maybe it's measuring it. We don't really know. We do feel that there are things that are happening, but do we have explanations for them all? Maybe not so clearly yet from a scientific point of view, but there are shifts. And from a, a healing perspective, also with, and I think it's fascinating, Ross Elmer Green was one of my mentors and we had the copper room, a copper wall at Holos. So I've sat in front of that wall and doing self-healing because there was a lot that needed to happen for me in particular. I was living across the street from ground zero and recovering from uh, an illness when I eventually went to Holo. So sitting in the in front of the copper wall actually was an incredible meditative experience that sometimes it was super energetic and uncomfortable and other times it was really peaceful. And I think it was also what I brought into that field myself besides maybe even what was there as thought forms or other things that were going on in that environment it was a fairly large room and also i think that what's also playing a role in this and it is measurable is ac and dc energy and i've played with some tools as a healer and i think that there's there's a differentiation with people who are able to move dc energy as direct current rather than an alternating current and maybe you all have something more to say on that, but when I was playing with those, some of those tools myself, that's when I noticed a shift in using some of this, the skills that, that I've worked with. So it's subtle, but it's not so subtle. <laughs> that's okay, Ross, and then I have a question for Bill. Just a quick response about the ACDC issue. Now, in Elmer Green's work, they had the DC offset that they measured. That's the 50, 70 volt part that I was talking about, they also had an AC aspect that they saw, which was that on occasion, and this was mostly in healers where they saw this, um, the voltage would drop down. Normally, this is a positive offset. It would drop down to zero uh, over a span of about 5 to 15 seconds and then go back up to the high level it was. So they, they called them pulses. Um, they actually worked up a, a equivalent dipole model for this was published in the uh, SSE journal, SJE, um, JSE, excuse me, and uh, uh, when was that, about 1990, um, and it involves, it's either a vast movement of charge in the body in an alternating way, in a dynamic way, um, or else it's an a influx of charge coming into the body. Uh, either way, I don't think anybody really knows what's going on with this. But one other comment about the AC part is that there have been some really interesting low-frequency measures of people, especially Qigong practitioners, DC, uh, not DC, but AC magnetic fields, usually around the hands. So we've been speaking about uh, energy, uh, the effects of intention on energy, perhaps some of the energy coming out of different chakras in the body. Uh, Bill, you had uh, posed a question on the web page can energy healing, can healing be stored? And the question is for you, can it be stored? And if it can be, where is it stored? Is it stored in the physical body? Is it in some aspect of the biofield, the chakras? What does your work uh, taught you about that? The short answer is, and I say this as a skeptic, yes, it can be stored. <laughs> I have so many replications that, you know, even I have to give up. You know, I throw, throw on the white flag. Your question, though, uh, is exactly the right one. In what can it be stored and what does it mean to store? Uh, and so I have uh, um, uh, ample data that depends on how much you want me to go into this. I have ample data that shows that it can be stored in inorganic material. Uh, so, for example, water. Uh, we can take water and 
infuse, use these loosely, infuse intention into it, and that, that intention can do work. Um, I, I have a whole bunch of water experiments. Uh, we can do this in organic material. And so I know it can be stored in cotton. I know it can be stored in lab medium that, that in cells that are grown. I know it can be stored in life itself. And so, for example, a mouse will have the storage of the healing information in it once it's been treated, and they can transfer this to another mouse by a blood transfusion and carry over the healing. I, I almost said signal. I don't know what I'm carrying over. Uh, and so I, I, I'm reasonably confident, at least in terms of mice, in terms of cotton, in terms of water, in terms of cell medium, I don't know the, the limits on what it can be stored in, uh, but it seems to be pretty widespread. What it's stored in and what holds together the effect on a mouse versus effect on just water, uh, past my pay grade. Uh, and, and, and so I transitioned since I've you know been looking at this for 130 years. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I would give Ross's right arm uh, to get the answers to any of the questions raised here. No offense, Ross, but it's for a good cause. Um, uh, but if we store it, we can also make it practical. Yeah, very much so. But, but I have to ask, I know you've been doing this for 130 years, published a lot on it. What would it take for you, as far as evidence from, let's say, your own studies or another, for you to transition from being kind of the, this endless skeptic that you describe yourself into somebody who's like, okay, this is actually real and it's going on? Oh, I, I, I have no question that it's real and going on. Uh, I, I, you know, at this point, you know, no matter how thick and slow I am, uh, it's real. Uh, I don't even find whether or not healing is real to be an interesting question. And I completely lose patience where people go, do you believe this stuff? And my answer is, no, I don't believe it. It is. You know, give me a break. I, you know, it'd be like someone come up to me and say, do you believe in gravity? And I go, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not decided yet. Um, how gravity works is the interesting scientific question. That it does work and we can use it to produce work is the application. So your skepticism is around uh, the mechanisms and, and so forth. Yeah. And, okay. And, the simpler explanations. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Yep. So there's a big question I'm going to ask you first, Tiffany. We haven't really addressed this. What exactly is the biofield? And what is it, what is it doing there? What does it do for our physicality? Wow. It, okay. So my presence with it and what I observe it's kind of like, and I find this fascinating, from an astrophysics point of view, we can see all of these layers around the Earth, the troposphere, the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, they all have different properties. And they have different ways of measuring it. There's a, a beginning and a middle and an end to these fields. You do different things, and this is well known and well understood in, in the launching of satellites. And, and what exactly sphere and where you're going to go and all of those sort of things. So there's sort of been a territory mapped. And I, I believe that there's, if, if the adage holds true, as above, so below, as below, so above, my sense of is when I am working on perception, tuning into the mental aspect of somebody's field, tuning into an emotional aspect of somebody's field, or tighter to the body, the etheric, which is where the in in my training and understanding and my uh, experience of are the the chakras and some of the meridians that are also in that etheric sort of template, and and so the field, the biofield, to me is made up of all of these properties that have all of these constituents in them that are unique from level to level. And there's different, with, with intention, you work on yourself and with others at a specific area for a specific need. And I, I totally agree with what the, the mice have taught us, that they're only going to come where the cells have taught us. They're, they're only, there's only a need when there's a need. And so to do things just for sport, it's like, ah. Eh, don't don't make a mockery of me, right? Like let's let's use this field in a collective way. And then also the collective of the entire field 
are all of those properties added up together. So that, that's my two cents. The thing that I'm curious about and what took me to graduate seminary and to study with Norm is what are the mechanisms of action? Because I could see always since I was a kid, stuff happens out here. It doesn't necessarily need to take place in the physical. So if we can handle something that's out in the field, wow, that that's so much more helpful. Let's not have it be deposited in our body to become something. Let's fix it in the field first or, or work with it. And then, of course, if the tumor needs to be your teacher, then that's what the, that's the trajectory of of karmic experiences. But anyway, that that's what I have to say about that. I could go on, but I won't. Thank you. Shamini, question for you. And it looks like you have something else you want to add anyway. But my question will be, you founded the Consciousness and Healing Initiative some years back. It's devoted to helping us understand the biofield, consciousness itself, and healing. What, what research has yet to be done that needs to be done to really get us to the next step, a significant next step, and, and all these things we're speaking about on the panel? Well, just to, you know, to cap on on what Tiffany was saying earlier, when someone asks what the biofield is, it's like asking what consciousness is. And, you know, there are whole conferences and, and books devoted to the subject. And I tried to tackle this a little bit in my book. But the truth is nobody fully agrees, just like nobody fully agrees what consciousness is. You've heard us debating about energy and information. Here's what we know, though. As Tiffany was saying, we can look at it in different levels of scale. And that's what's going on now. So it's almost biofields with a plural, I would say, because we can look at the biofield of a cell, the biofield of a person, the biofield of an interaction between people, even the connection of us with the earth. And those are all ways that we're studying biofields right now. So to your question, Paul, with the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, we bring together scientists on a regular basis to explore what do we currently know and what do we need to do to advance the field of research? There's probably about 125 randomized controlled trials on biofield healing approaches, things like Reiki, healing touch, including, you know, energy psychology practices, a lot of data there as well. That may sound like a lot, but it's actually not. When you look at how things like mindfulness and other approaches have really become mainstream, it's because they did rest on a preponderance of evidence. With all of the beautiful studies we've been talking about today, they're just coming out of a couple of labs. So there has to be greater investment in the field, both with cells, with animals, for people who do animal research, but also with humans, right? Because the payoff is great. You know, I think for all of us, what is, I'll just speak for myself, what's fascinating about the biofield is that it teaches us how deeply we're connected. And that's something that we're kind of moving out of this rhetoric of separatism where these disconnected bodies, you know, we're disconnected from our emotions, we're disconnected from each other, all totally false. And the biofield helps us understand how deeply we're connected. So if we invest in this research and supporting the scientists and practitioners who are doing the work, then the payoffs are great for humanity because we basically wake up to our full healing capacity. And that's the vision of our collaborative at the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. So, you know, as you know, so many of you are working tirelessly on different areas to educate people in the biofield, to do the research, and we want to support everyone as much as possible to move together cohesively and, and you know, as a human family. Beautiful. I want to emphasize that is a great point, again, for the panel, a take-home point, that we are indeed actually all connected, deeply, intimately connected, more a oneness than uh, in separation. And the biofield, as we understand it more and can get there, as far as the science, science is always behind personal experiences. Uh, we'll have all that more as a realization. Tiff, did you want to add to that? And then I have a question for Ross. And no, I, I was just just championing what Shamini was saying. It's absolutely, it's just so true and it's right on. Yes. Great. So here's my question, and this would help us get to a next step. And this has to do with the fact that we don't really currently have devices to fully, completely quantify and measure the biofield. Something like an fMRI, for example, some devices. And I know Ross um, and Bill, you've been at this a long time. What's your understanding of where the development of such devices is? Um, are you aware of anything in the works? Well, I'll just jump in here. I, I have to say that uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there that people make that they claim might be measuring the biofield, and that's tough to weed through all that stuff. There's probably hidden gems in it. Um, it needs more work, evaluation, 
the strategy I've been pursuing is to try to use multiple sensors and, and cover the aspect. Because I, I, I totally agree that there's an informational aspect to this, but there also seems to be a manifestation. If something is doing work, that involves energy. And so there's a manifestation of some kind of energy as well. Um, so I just try to cover it all. And so, sooner or later, some brilliant young genius is going to come up with the, the the thing that gets us over to whatever it is. Because I, one other comment I'd like to make is that if it can be stored, as Bill is describing, then what is it? Mm -hmm. Precisely. Bill, can you tell us a little bit more about that work you've done storing? You mentioned storing, I know, in water. You said from your own research, and you also mentioned cotton. Um, can you give us a bit of insight into some of that research? I'm not familiar with it. Well, and it, it, it's not just, I, I'm looking right now, I'm focusing on scalable systems. So even if, for example, you can store healing in cotton, if you have to keep treating cotton like it's a client, it's not store. If cotton doesn't charge other cotton, uh, it doesn't become scalable. And what I'd like to, to have happen, and, and I think the, the way to make healing um, accepted and, and conventional is to be able to pro mass produce it uh, so that uh, like you would have a vitamin. You need a vitamin. Well, here's here's a pill. Uh, you need a battery. Well, here's a battery. You need I mean, all of these we're storing stuff all the time and we're used to it. Uh, there's a couple things going on. If we're talking about moving into the clinical area, there is an inexhaustible supply of people in pain. I don't care how many people are trained, there's more people out there who need it than there are people who can supply it. How do we get it out there and really, you know, let it, let it happen? Well, uh, a couple of, couple of ways. Uh, I'm working at, on a mass producible system uh, this is different than a helometer. It's a mass producible system that will take an, a particular healing intention and put it into water and have that water reproduce the original intention. That is going great guns. Uh, it, it seems that water is a wonderful mechanism for, for storing. When we have a mouse that's been cured of cancer or that's been treated for cancer and it's on its way to being cured, and we, we have the blood in that that is, I'm using loosely, it's stored in the mouse, we can take that mouse and use that mouse to donate to other mice and those other mice will be cured. You can see screaming here, we have the, the possibility of making a vaccine. You know, the analog to a vaccine, except a healing vaccine. Or And, and what I don't know is whether the healing becomes a generic offering from which the healee, who I think strives this, takes what they need. So I give you a multivitamin, you swallow the multivitamin, most of the stuff is excreted. But it turns out today you needed vitamin D, so you're absorbing the vitamin D. It turns out tomorrow you need the vitamin C, you're taking the vitamin C. I think of healing as, as close to analogous like white light. And you need blue. Well, blue is a subtraction from white light. Green is a different subtraction from white light. What do you need? That's not my problem as a healer. It's also not the healee's problem, because that would imply that they know. I think the body knows. I don't sit there and say, well, I'm going to concentrate on digesting my food now. I just digest my food. I don't think the bodies consciously digest the healing. I think they just digest the healing. You know, I think it's, it's an analogous way there. A scalable system, uh, something that uh, I, I have published in a bunch um, and actually just had an acceptance today on a good journal, um, is can we record the intention itself? And now we're getting into more abstract stuff. Can we record the intention? If the recording actually is reproducing the initial effect, a recording could be globally scalable. So I've got in vitro studies on cancer cells where I take healing intention being recorded in a very elaborate system, and it's not a secret, it's just kind of too much to talk about here, and I actually have a recording system, and that recording system reproduces the effect on the cancer cells, or that recording reproduces the effects on the mice, or that recording reproduces the effects on a person, it's, it becomes globally scalable. Now it turns out, 
you can make it technology. I can even give you a proportion of how close it's come to a human application. The recording changes the cells. It, 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 it changes the mice. It changes the people. It, change, it changes. It works. Uh, it does not replicate fully the effect of a human intervention yet. But that's a technological problem. How do we make it better? We can put it out there, dissect it, make it better, tweak it, you know, and that's that's my ongoing series of experiments uh, to do it. A recording is scalable. Charge cotton, not so much. I'd like to see some translation of those findings of yours out uh, into the real world as soon, soon as possible. Yeah. Tiffany, you've done a lot of work with pranic healing, which I know involves using different colors for healing the person. They don't know which color they need, but you, you offer a variety of colors. I imagine you've had experience seeing this phenomenon that Bill was just describing, that the person, the body, the field begins to pull in that color, which, which they're needing at that particular time. Can you speak on that? Sure. Uh, in pranic healing in particular, and, and I also believe that Shalmini had something to add to Bill's discussion, but the in it's like a, a almost a, a cookbook model. There's recipes that you might do, and oftentimes and there's there's lots of them so there's protocols that are somewhat built in i at times with people have needed to adjust because i'm just being i'm being tuned probably to that person's field for what is the actual need and i i may make a slight adjustment not a huge adjustment because there's there's richness in doing things in, in a protocolized way and there's something i would like to add to what bill's saying because the it's really nice to have the cooperation of the body in healing, but I've also worked with people where the mind fights it and is not allowing that to fully take place in the human. And, and obviously mice are, are not gonna argue with the receptivity of what they're getting, but in the human form, it, you know, people just saying, I, in, in their mind, there's nothing here, there's nothing that's gonna work here. So they, there's like different hurdles to get over and in which case that we would also use different colors in chronic psychotherapy, for instance. So there's different colors that you would use and, and also almost with an opacity that besides the color, it's the intensity. It's almost like you're adding a pigment almost and or taking away a pigment. So the more refined the energy, the more pastel it gets. The, the, the denser the area of where you, we need to work. If it was, um, I did some self-culture, things earlier on and there's delicacy but there's also a time where you really need to use a very rich like full pigmented color so it is there's intelligence in in that there's there's information in that thank you fascinating shamani so i'm going to try to be brief <laughs> bill when i was listening to you i first of all just wow what amazing work you have continued to put forth to just expand our minds about what is possible and right. how all of this works so thank you and thank ross you know all of you for all of the incredible work you continue to do i was just sort of playing out in my mind what happens if if we realize this achievement you know that you're suggesting that we can make this really scalable and how could we do that and you you proposed a way right maybe it's through mediums maybe it's some sort of energetic vaccine and you know as a clinician i was just carrying that all the way forward for myself and i realized that maybe you know to tiffany's point she mentioned you know there has to be readiness of the healy we talked about the how the healy is often really probably driving these effects in this in the first place so the question of how do we make this sustainable how do we make healing sustainable for everyone it just it occurred to me that one thing we haven't really talked about that i've heard from pretty much every healer i talk to is what this is is that these are all energy healers biofield healers various traditions and the only thing that they have really in common, they see the field differently, they feel the field differently, some of them hear the field, you know, lots of differences in the way that they perceive it. But the one commonality is they say, I'm not doing the healing. So we all kind of have heard that before. What I am doing is working with the person's biofield to connect them back to their higher self, their spirit, 
consciousness, however they describe it. And, and I'm, I talk about this in my book because I talk about the biofield being a bridge between the spiritual and the physical. And we haven't really touched on the spiritual today, but when I think about sustainability, I think about, you know, this white light that you mentioned, Bill, the ability for us to connect in with the larger field of the interconnectedness of who we are through, and I will call it, spiritual practice. I will not call it just mind-body practice. I will not just call it, you know, therapy. Sure, all of those are effective, but we can do yoga and call it a mind-body practice, and guess what? That's the effect we're going to see. We can do yoga and actually approach it as a spiritual practice as well as an energetic practice and experience that. So in terms of sustainability, we could have like an energy vaccine, but if we don't have people that are able to reconnect in with our spiritual nature, we won't be able, I think, to be able to prevent disease, prevent mental suffering in the way that we could if we utilize the biofield to its best and highest purpose, and this is just my opinion, to reconnect people back to their soul and their spirit, then I think we could actually achieve the goal of health sustainability. But that's just my opinion. As an opinion, we all very much appreciate it, I think. Anybody would like to weigh in on that and Shamani's uh, comments and perspective? Yeah, I, I agree with her. Um, I, I would like to know what it is. Uh, if, if we have spirituality as connection, I think healing is connection. Uh, I've got a bunch of research and publications on what you call resonance, uh, the resonant phenomenon, which I think is transient. Uh, so we can be connected and we can be disconnected. So I can love my dog on Monday and hate my dog on Tuesdays. You know, it's, it's not the dog. It's the same dog. Uh, but the connection is there or the connection is not there. I think healing fosters connection or connection fosters healing. I'm not sure which way it should go. It may, it may not matter, uh, but I think they are, you know, roughly the same thing. And I would take it out into the practical world, though, and, and, and sorry to go off the, from the spiritual part, uh, and take certain phenomena such as placebo effects. Um, I, d I don't know that placebo effects are psychological. Uh, I suspect that placebo effects might be connection, but it's connection between physically separate groups. In which case, you got a boatload of misinterpretation of data. Just like if you have experimenter effects, you have misinterpretation of data. If you have conditioned space, you have misinterpretation of data. Uh, and I think I, there's reasonable evidence to suggest all those things are real. There are experimenter effects. Some people get different responses than others. Uh, there are conditioned space phenomena. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, this is a study at Brown University. We were looking at the effects of a healing recording on cell cancer cells in vitro. And we had reliable 68 genomic changes, seven iterations of the thing. Uh, we had uh, reliable genomic changes in the cancer cells and, and all of that. One of the things we didn't publish was when we play the recording inside an incubator, the incubator now has the ability to heal. And so you wait, we've waited three days later and stuck cancer cells into the incubator and not run the recording and you get the same genomic changes. Wow. Now that's reasonably interesting. I didn't publish that because it was published in a conventional biology journal. And I don't know if you know any biologists, they're not the most open to these ideas. Uh, so I, I showed that, that healing happens. I showed that uh, healing can be stored. I showed that it can be replicated. I showed, I showed, I showed. But I didn't touch the idea of conditioned space because that would, frankly, screw up almost any biology laboratory. And I think biology <laughs> laboratories are screwed up with the conditioned space of previous experiments. So the world out there is more complicated than we'd like it to, to be. And certain of our faith-based, you know, you talk about me as a skeptic, I'm also skeptical of the assumptions under which we work scientifically. So an experiment presupposes that physical separateness means independence. I'm a skeptic. I think there's action at a distance, in which case, try to interpret the data. Indeed, all that. Uh, um, Tiffany and Shamini, you have two giants of the field here with you. Um, this is an opportunity to ask them any question you want to that we haven't gotten to so far. Anything, Tiff, Shamani? Sure. Um, I mean, it's a question for all of you, actually. We know that this field is still considered woo by mainstream science and medicine. 
Um, we know a lot of people listening to this may be very intrigued. A lot of us might be listening to this and just be in a kind of state of disbelief, right? The doubting you've experienced this throughout your life and your work and your research, trying to publish papers and all of this. What keeps you going? What keeps each of you going and so passionate about this field as I am? I mean, I know people think I'm passionate about the field, but I know each of you are equally, if not more, passionate about this field as me and so many of you. I would love to hear from each of you. What keeps you going with this work? Start with Ross. Okay. Well, there's two things, really. Uh, one of them is personal experience. Uh, as I mentioned, I got started in psychic research back at Duke and I don't know, like Bill, a hundred years ago, and uh, <laughs> I, I witnessed some very wild stuff um, that convinced me right from the get-go. There's something going on here, and that has gone on through the years. Uh, I continue to have interesting encounters. So, but that's part two of my answer: is the people that I meet who are having these experiences. Um, it's been especially rich at the Monroe Institute because the people that are coming through there are fascinating and interesting. They are into making that spiritual connection that Shamini is talking about, and they have phenomenon that phenomena that's occurring in conjunction with that um, consciousness explorers, I guess you could say. And, and it's just a it's absolutely fascinating, and I think extremely important for the uh, future of humanity. The, the whole area is, is just so endlessly fascinating, you know, and like many people, like Ross describes, I got into it from first-person experience. I used to have a chronic bad back, and some loser came along, put his hands on my back, and I haven't had a back pain since. That's annoying. You know, it, it, it disrupts my world. Uh, you know, life was good before I got cured. Uh, and and uh, all my experiments do exactly the same thing. So when I get, was personally cured, and it was cure, and it has sustained over many, many decades, uh, if when I was personally cured, I, I, the, the curiosity, you know, the antenna went up going, what in heaven's name is going on here? If I got cured, and obviously I'm not a believer, if, I'm not, if I got cured, something serious is going on here. This is seriously interesting. Now, when I do an experiment... It's wonderful. I get the exact same mind world blowing up phenomena because experiments never come out the way I expected. I can I can generate hypotheses decade after decade and be wrong in every single one of them, which means I don't have any idea how the world works. You know, and I find that to be freeing. I don't have to get behind and be a believer and defend it. So Ross can tell me, you know, you're full of full of it, and I'll go, Of course I'm full of it. Give me a break. The only issue is of what am I full of? <laughs> and I love the evolution and finding out that everything we think is real is not. It makes it more interesting out there. So I'm, I'm a, a glutton for punishment. <laughs> Thank I, you for that. Tiffany. I just have to just uh, have a moment of appreciation and pure gratitude for all of you. And the stick to itiveness and the, you know, the spooky action at a distance or not at a distance or wherever it is that we're tracking and just, just doing the work and being consistent and showing up without biases and without a lot of ideas. And I know there's bias in even being human, but the experience of science is its own teacher. And I just really appreciate the, the, showing up for it, for whatever it is. And to, two things I, I want to say to answer, uh, to address something that Bill mentioned and then also address Shamani's question. I was part of the data um, analysis team that was putting together details from Joey Jones lab many years ago. It was a pranic healing and it was a cell culture experiment that was going on. There was a whole set of things that something happened. So this speaks to condition space. But this, these, uh, experiments were going on over a period of time. Well, something had taken place in the lab in between. All of a sudden, all of the healing stopped. Like there, and, and it was ultimately, I'll keep this very brief, the lab needed to be cleansed. It got really contaminated and polluted. And so we had all this beautiful data and then something shifted. And then not until a cleansing took place to make the space actually be set up for healing again, did we see the similar results that we saw at the beginning. So I think that's fascinating. And to answer what Shomini was asking about, what keeps me going at least, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm young on this trail 
And I feel like I've also been at it for a little while, but it's just with a great fervor of, we don't have it all figured out yet. And how fun that we don't have it all figured out yet, that we can make experiments, that we can have dialogue and discussion where science and spirituality are part of the same conversation in order to help us advance where we're going, because it is really and both. And how we are spiritual beings, and we are also physical and have other components and attributes to us to be able to have an effect with. So we still don't have the sensors out there. Maybe, Ross, you're really close. I, I don't know. I'd love to work with you on this. The 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 sensors that, that can essentially sense and feel what so many of us have already convinced ourselves that of, of the it, of, of what is it that we're a feeling. And I think plasma plays a role. So and there's different different forms of plasma, but I, I think plasma plays a role, both in the water, in our physical structure, mm -hmm. and in in um, I, our ionized space. Well, that was lovely for me to hear all, all the different aspects of what's been driving you all these years, all of you, each of you, your work. There's the, there's the, being the scientist and the endless curiosity, but there's also been the personal experience in each of you, an observation of experience of others, the biofield that's important to our health and well-being, but also that, importantly, that sense of connectedness and overcoming the illusion of separation that so many people carry around. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to participate in this panel. It's been just excellent, and I'm sure very useful for the viewers of the summit. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.